you very much for joining us. As soon as we learned of the new Omicron variant, this government acted, introducing targeted and proportionate measures as a precaution whilst our scientists discovered more and were learning more every day. We don't yet know Omicron's severity, its exact rate of transmission, nor indeed the full effectiveness of our vaccines against it. But since I last spoke to you, it's become increasingly clear that Omicron is growing much faster than the previous Delta variant, and it's spreading rapidly all around the world. 568 cases have been confirmed through genomic sequencing across every region of the UK, and the true number is certain to be much higher. Most worryingly, there is evidence that the doubling time of Omicron in the UK could currently be between two and three days. And while there are some limits on what we can learn from South Africa uh, because of the different uh, rates of vaccination, uh, different rates of previous infection, we're seeing growth in cases here in the UK that now mirrors the rapid increases previously seen in South Africa. And South Africa is also seeing hospitalizations roughly doubling in a week meaning that we can't yet assume that Omicron is less severe than previous variants. So while the picture may get better, and I sincerely hope that it will, we know that the remorseless logic of exponential growth could lead to a big rise in hospitalizations and therefore, sadly, in deaths. And that's why it's now the proportionate and the responsible thing to move to Plan B in England, while continuing to work closely with our colleagues in the devolved administrations so we slow the spread of the virus, buy ourselves the time to get yet more boosters into arms and especially in the older and more vulnerable people and understand the answers to the key outstanding questions about Omicron. So first, we will reintroduce the guidance to work from home. Guidance to work from home. Employers should use the rest of the week to discuss working arrangements with their employees. But from Monday, you should work from home if you can. Go to work if you must, but work from home if you can. And I, I know this will be hard uh, for, uh, for many people, but by reducing your contacts in the workplace, you will help slow transmission. Second, from this Friday, we will further extend the legal requirement to wear a face mask to most, to most public indoor venues, including theatres and cinemas. There will be, of course, exceptions where it's not practical, such as when eating, drinking, exercising or singing. Third, we'll also make the NHS COVID pass mandatory for entry into nightclubs and venues where large crowds gather, including unseated indoor venues with more than 500 people, unseated outdoor venues with more than 4,000 people, and any venue with more than 10,000 people. The NHS COVID pass can still be obtained with two doses, but we will keep this under review as the boosters roll out. And having taken clinical advice since the emergence of Omicron, a negative lateral flow test will also be sufficient. As we set out in Plan B, we will give businesses a week's notice, so this will come into force in a week's time, helping to keep these events and venues open at full capacity, while giving everyone who attends them confidence that those around them have done the responsible thing to minimise risk to others. As Omicron spreads in the community, we will also introduce daily tests for contacts instead of isolation so we keep people safe while minimizing the disruption to daily life. And of course, we will take every step to ensure our NHS is ready for the challenges ahead. But the single biggest thing that every one of us can do is to get our jabs, and crucially, to get that booster as soon as our turn arrives. One year to the day since the UK became the first country in the world to administer a COVID vaccine into the arms of Margaret Keenan, We've opened up the vaccine booster to all those over 40, and we're reducing the gap between second dose and booster to a minimum of just three months. Our heroic NHS staff and volunteers have already done almost 21 
million boosters, including reaching 84% of all the eligible over 80s. But we need to go further and faster still, because our scientists are absolutely confident that your immune, uh, your immune response will be stronger if you've been boosted. And while you're at it, please get your flu jab too. Let's do everything we can to protect ourselves and our loved ones this winter and to reduce the pressures on our NHS. As we learn more, so we will be guided by the hard medical data around four key criteria. The e efficacy of our vaccines and our boosters, the severity of Omicron, the speed of its spread, and the rate of hospitalizations. We will constantly monitor the data and keep it under review. And of course, we must be humble in the face of this virus. But if and uh, indeed as soon as it becomes clear that the boosters are capable of holding this Omicron variant, and we've boosted enough people to do that job of keeping Omicron in equilibrium, then we will be able to move forward as before. So please, everybody, play your part and get boosted. I'm now going to hand over to Chris to do the slides. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, first slide, please. Uh, I wanted to situate this uh, initially on where we are with Delta because what's happening is Omicron is coming on the back of a still high rate of Delta transmission and hospitalisation. So in the first slide, what we have is the number of people testing positive for COVID uh, in the UK. Uh, and that has been drifting upwards, not at a very rapid rate, but it has been drifting upwards. Uh, the Omicron uh, data aren't really going to be visible in this uh, for a few days, but they will become visible over time. Next slide, please. Uh, the number of people in the hospital with COVID in the UK has, uh, because of uh, the booster vaccination program in particular, uh, been drifting down uh, at, until this point in time, with the numbers going into hospital uh, reducing, although that's now stabilised slightly. Uh, and that's really because the boosters are particularly going to protect and are protecting people who are in the highest uh, risk categories, as the Prime Minister has said. Next slide, please. And the number of people in the UK who are dying uh, has again gradually been decreasing over time, but uh, is still uh, an av a daily average uh, of 121 deaths from COVID. So we still have a significant issue with COVID, and I think anybody who speaks to anyone working in the NHS would say that is on top of an incredibly busy system. Next slide, please. In terms of our main major countermeasures, of course, the biggest one, as the Prime Minister has said, is boosting. Uh, and this is steadily increasing. So we now have over a third of those who are eligible have already had a booster, and they are by and large, the most vulnerable uh, third, but there's still people who are in, uh, in, in higher risk groups who have not been boosted. Uh, and of course, we have to move down those groups. And that is going to become absolutely critical, we think, uh, as we move on to, into a period when Omicron becomes significant and probably then becomes dominant. Next slide, please. And if uh, this is a, just a data, data just to uh, show quite how effective with the variants we've had to date, vaccination uh, can be. And what it compares is in the dark lines, the hospitalization rate in the, the blue-black uh, bars uh, in those who are um, unvaccinated uh, and in the uh, orange bars, those who are vaccinated with two doses. This is uh, largely protecting against Delta. But as you can see, at every age, a really substantial improvement uh, in your protection. Next slide, please. So now we move on to the data on Omicron. And these are data probably people have seen ver versions of in, uh, in media over the last few days. But I think they do need, uh, point, uh, need sort of uh, fleshing out a bit. So these are the number of, pe of people testing positive for COVID-19 in South Africa. At this point in time, the big increase in COVID uh, in South Africa is virtually all uh, the Omicron variant. And uh, this is now spread all around South Africa. And as you can see, this is an incredibly steep increase uh, in rates. Uh, and we're now seeing this translating into increasing in increases in hospitalizations. So for example, I was talking to some of my colleagues from South Africa this afternoon. 
and they were saying that uh, informal data still to be uh, still to be uh, added to, but there was around about a 300 uh, percent increase on hospitalizations uh, over the last week. Uh, so um, some of those will have come in with uh, Omicron, and some of them will come in as a result of Omicron. Uh, but the fact is those numbers are going up very sharply. Next slide, please. So what's happening here in the UK? Well, I'm afraid that um, the data here are now uh, clear. Uh, what you can see here is the uh, number on the left and on the right the percentage of cases with, a, with what's called S-gene target failure. This is a marker for Omicron. Virtually all the cases now who've got this marker will have Omicron. A very small number at the bottom will not. And as you can see, whether you look at the absolute count or the percentage, this is going up incredibly fast now. And as the Prime Minister has said, this is doubling at this point in time. It may slow down, and the aim of the, the measures uh, announced by the Prime Minister is, is to slow things down, but it's doubling currently between two and three, every two and three days. That is an extraordinarily fast rate, and you therefore can get with very small numbers to very large numbers really quite quickly. Now, the question, uh, obviously, people reasonably want to ask is, will this feed through to people in hospital and how quickly? And I think I'd just like to uh, just point out two realities. First of all, uh, and the first one is a good one, but at the moment the spread is in younger people who would, you would not expect to go into hospital and it's once it starts moving up the ages and into vulnerable groups that you'll start to see that. So there will be a lag as it moves into more vulnerable groups. And then we know from previous waves, and this is not particularly surprising, that there is a delay between people becoming infected with COVID and ending up with symptoms and then with hospitalisation. So there's usually about a two-week delay. We would therefore not expect that these cases, that the case rates in hospital will start to go up for a number of probably two to three weeks. And in that period, if you're doubling up at the speed we're talking about now, we move from very small numbers to really substantial numbers and it will keep on doubling. And that really is the uh, reason why these measures have been announced uh, by the Prime Minister as agreed by uh, ministers today. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, Patrick, anything you, you want to add? OK, good. Uh, well, let's, let's go to members of the public. Uh, then Dave from Chester. Are mandatory vaccinations being considered like they are in the EU and other global nations? And if not, why? Why is it acceptable to put measures on our freedoms, but not that on our vaccination statuses? Thanks, Dave. Well, I said right at the beginning of this pandemic that uh, uh, I think or as soon as we were really talking about vaccination seriously, uh, that I didn't want uh, us to have a, a society and a culture where we force people to get vaccinated. I don't think that's ever been the, the, the way we do things in this country. And actually, Dave, we've been able to achieve uh, through the voluntarism of the British people, through their incredible public spiritedness, willingness to roll up their, their sleeves and get vaccinated, uh, huge numbers, huge proportions of our, of our population. I think that uh, there is going to come a point if we can, uh, if we can show that the, uh, the vaccines are capable of, of holding the uh, of Omicron, uh, and that's the, the key thing that I think that we need to, to test. Well, I do think that we're going to have to have a, a conversation about uh, ways in which we, uh, we deal with this uh, pandemic, because I want to be absolutely clear with you, I don't believe we can keep going indefinitely uh, with uh, uh, non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions, uh, I mean restrictions on people's way of life, uh, where just because uh, a substantial proportion of the population still, sadly, has not got uh, vaccinated. And I think we're going to need to have a, a national conversation about the, the way forward and, uh, and the other things that we can do uh, to protect those who are, are hard to reach, who haven't got vaccinated for one reason or another, who, who may have medical uh, reasons why they can't get vaccinated, other ways of, of protecting them. Uh, but that uh, is a stage that I think we will... Uh, come to if and when uh, we establish, uh, as I hope that we will, that the, uh, the booster is effective against Omicron and the booster is capable of, of holding Omicron, getting us back into that uh, equilibrium uh, that the, the double jabs uh, got us into uh, with, uh, with Delta, if, 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 you, 
if you follow me. So uh, it's at that moment that I think we will have to talk seriously about uh, moving on uh, from uh, the way we, uh, the, from thinking about further, uh, further NPIs and, and uh, thinking about other ways in which we, we protect people. Uh, Rachel from Essex. Rachel asks, why can't fully vaccinated British travellers stuck in red-listed countries self-isolate at home uh, when they return instead of a hotel? Quarantine hotels are too expensive, especially as this was implemented at short notice, not giving travellers a chance to, to get home. Well, uh, Rachel, I think that's a very fair challenge. I think that uh, given the way Omicron is now seeded uh, around the world and, uh, and not just in, in red-listed countries, I think we, we will be uh, looking at the, uh, the red list and the way that we, uh, we do it. But uh, it's, it's been very important in the immediate period, the immediate response to Omicron to have very tough border measures uh, to slow the arrival of the, uh, of the variant in this, in this country. And that was the, uh, the objective of those uh, measures and continues to be the objective. I mean, Chris, Patrick, anything you want to add to, to, to that? OK, then let's go straight to Laura Koonsberg of BBC News. Um, thank you very much, Prime Minister. You're tightening the rules again for millions of people tonight. How can you stand at that lectern exactly where some of your team laughed and joked about COVID rules and tell people they must now follow your new instructions? And are you really asking the public to believe that you had no idea what was going on under your own roof? Uh, actually, the first thing I want to say, thanks very much, Laura. The first thing I want to say is that uh, I, I know that uh, today uh, Allegra Stratton has, has resigned and I, and I wanted to, uh, to pay tribute to her because she has been, uh, in, in, in spite of what uh, everybody has seen, and, uh, uh, and, and, and I, again, I make, I make no excuses for uh, the frivolity with which the, the subject was handled uh, in, that, uh, in that rehearsal uh, that people saw in that clip, uh, and there could be no excuse for it, and it was, it was uh, I, I, can, I can totally understand how infuriating it, it was, but I want to say that Allegra has been uh, a, a fine colleague, has achieved a great deal uh, in her time in government and was a particularly effective spokesman for COP26. She coined uh, the, the coal, cars, cash, trees agenda and helped really to, to, to marshal and, and to rally the, the world behind the agreement in COP26. Uh, and uh, I, I really, Laura, if you forgive me, I wanted to, to say that because I think it's been uh, uh, you know, a, a sad day for her as well. Uh, as an infuriating uh, event for many, many people around the around the country, and on that on that point, uh, look, I just want to I want to repeat that the, the fundamental point is that uh, I think the the, the British public, um, notwithstanding the, the the point that you make, can see the vital importance of the medical information uh, that we're giving, uh, and they can see the need uh, to take it. Uh, to heart and, and to act upon it. And that point has been proved time and time again. And it's never been more conspicuous in the way that the public has responded to the, uh, the vaccine uh, rollout and the way that they've, uh, they've done the responsible thing. So uh, I'm, I'm, I, I take my encouragement uh, from the way uh, the public have, have dealt with it themselves. Um, Anushka Astana of, of ITV. Prime Minister, you've only really agreed to an investigation into what happened on December the 18th last year because of the video that emerged from this room. And Allegra Stratton's resignation seems to further suggest that a party took place despite the denials. But we've also had serious allegations about parties on three other occasions. So I want to ask you why they aren't being investigated. Is it because you haven't been caught out in those cases or is it because reports are true that you attended some of them. And to the rest of you here, can I ask how worried you are about whether this undermines public trust? Because the polling suggests that it does do, and Conservative MPs are openly saying that it's very hard now to mandate the public to act. Th thanks very much, Anushka. Well, I repeat what I said uh, in the House and uh, earlier today. Uh, the, uh, the Cabinet Secretary uh, will... Uh, conduct an, uh, an inquiry into the, the uh, in, into what took place on December the 18th. Uh, as for other events that uh, uh, other dates that you mentioned, I, as far as I'm aware, to the best of my knowledge, uh, and 
we have followed the rules throughout, and that is that is uh, what you would expect. Indeed, we followed the rules, as far as I'm aware, uh, the rules were followed uh, on December the 18th as well. And uh, you know, I, I just I just repeat that point. But uh, it's clearly important that the cabinet secretary is able to get to the bottom of it. But in the meantime, on your you know your your sort of glo your global your, your big point again, uh, Anushka, which is really the same as as Laura's. I think the uh, overwhelmingly the the public see uh, the importance of the uh, the messages that they are getting via this uh, medium. It is imperfect. Uh, we do what we can to explain uh, what we think is is necessary. Uh, I know it's contentious. I know it's difficult, and, and I know that sometimes it, the the messages are, are confusing. Uh, we do our absolute best to make it as, as clear as possible, and we do everything that we can uh, to protect public health. That's what we're, uh, we're, uh, we're driven by. But uh, Chris yeah. and Patrick, you were well, asked. I mean, the, the measures work because people follow them, and that's been shown time and time again during this. So it's incredibly important everyone follows it. It's everybody. It was incredibly important throughout. It's going to be incredibly important going forward, um, and it only works if we all do it. And we're now facing um, a viral variant that's rapidly progressing. It's got a doubling time of between two and three days. And measures need to be taken to try and slow the spread of that variant, as well as, and I think this is important, us all boosting our own defences by getting a booster jab. So I think you know, the rules are there quite carefully thought through and given scientific evidence. And they're there because they're important and they're there for everybody to stick to. Yeah, if I can just add to that, I mean, I think you know, we all know that people get very angry, including colleagues and friends, uh, and uh, when they feel that it's unfair. And the Prime Minister said that in the House of Commons, and he's said it, said it today. That's quite different from people, uh, I think, wanting to actually know what's going on and then make decisions. And I think those two need to be separated. And the point about what we're trying to do is trying to actually say, look, here are the reasons. This is moving very fast, doubling every two to three days. It is too early for us to be absolutely confident about hospitalizations. But I think uh, you've seen how things have gone before. That's probably the way to bet. And then if we're pleasantly surprised, no one would be happier than, than I would be and Patrick and the Prime Minister. Uh, and um, we know that it looked as if he was going to be able to evade uh, vaccination and now clinically we know that it can in terms of infection so we know that is an issue therefore the boosters become significantly more important and we know that we're going early now so as to try and be able to slow this down at an early stage of events and I think if it's laid out to people in a way that is reasonable irrespective of other things people want to know the logic as to why they're doing it and I hope we're trying to lay out the logic of trying to do that that's not in any way to try and move away from the, the earlier point but I just think those two should, should be kept, kept separate in people's minds thanks very much uh, Chris uh, Beth Rigby Sky um, Prime Minister on Allegra Stratton's resignation she resigned today she looked broken as she did it how did you feel when you watched that statement and watched what she said, heard what she said. And doesn't it lead to your leadership being questioned if others are taking responsibility for things that happen in this place instead of you taking responsibility? And to the scientists, people are gonna feel pretty flat today listening to this press conference. They were told to get their jabs, to get their boosters, that we would have an irreversible path out of lockdown, that life would continue winter comes, we are now being told that we have to live with restrictions again. Is this just the reality of living with COVID? So these, this is not just another year this is happening, but this is our lives now for years to come. I think people will be worried about that. Thank you. Yeah, so just, Beth, first on your first point, look, uh, yeah, I repeat what I said to, to Laura. I think that Allegra has been an outstanding uh, spokesperson for, uh, for the government for COP, uh, she did she did an extraordinary job, and I'm I'm very very sorry to to lose her. And on your point about responsibility, I don't just take responsibility for things that happen in this uh, in this in this building. Uh, I take responsibility for everything that happens in this in this government, and, I, and I've made I've made that clear uh, throughout the pandemic. On the um, question about where we are now and what that means for the future, this virus has mutated a lot quickly, and 
that is sort of what you'd expect at this stage, that you start to see more mutations. This one's got a lot more than anyone thought would arrive that quickly. And that's what's caused so many concerns about it, spreading very fast. The good news is that so far, it looks as though when you get very high antibody levels with the booster vaccine, it's definitely having some effect against it in the laboratory studies. We need to watch and see what happens uh, over the next few weeks as we get more data on that. So the boosters remain incredibly important as a way of increasing immunity. What we're on is a road from pandemic to endemic where this becomes a more sort of regular infection like flu or something over time. But we're in a sort of bumpy transition for that. And that's going to be difficult. And it is difficult now. And there are special measures that need to happen now to try and reduce the spread. It doesn't mean this is what happens in perpetuity. You would expect that over time this becomes a virus which then has peaks every year, just in the way that flu does, perhaps. But it wouldn't be endlessly having new variants that always escape, uh, escape vaccines to some extent. You would also expect that the vaccine will need to change over time, just as the flu vaccine changes year on year, and you get a slightly different one because the thing continues to evolve a bit. So I think this is a surprise change that's happened. It's a big one. And yes, it's going to make everyone feel a bit sort of deflated about it. But there are things that can be done. I think the vaccines are going to hold up to some extent here, and I think probably boosters will really push that to a level uh, that's going to be important. We need to test that and find out. And I don't think it's a harbinger of what happens hereafter. We, may see, we will see more variants, and they will always cause some sort of challenge, but that challenge is the same sort of challenge that you're going to see year on year with other things as well over time. Can I just add, add to that? Because I mean, I obviously completely agree. Um, we're in a sort of transition period from the point uh, when, we, when the pandemic first hit uh, in 2020, where we had to rely entirely on social measures and had no medical countermeasures. We will get to a stage where we have multiple countermeasures, probably lots of different types of vaccines, antivirals we currently don't, a whole variety of other ways, which is the way we have dealt now with very many infectious diseases. We're in that midpoint. Uh, we are immeasurably better off now than we were with the vaccines we've got, with drugs, with better hospital treatments, a whole bunch of things that are so much better than they were. It will be much quicker getting over this than it would have been if we the same situation had hit us a year ago. But we shouldn't, you know, at no point if we said that there wouldn't be new variants, significant ones potentially, and vaccine escape ones. That said, that's been said by almost every, I suspect every media outlet that's uh, represented here repeatedly, and for good reasons. That's the biological uh, inevitability. Now, when it comes to this particular, so in the long run, I think the outlook is good, but I think we have to accept that, that it's not, it is still a difficult period. And in terms of this particular variant, um, the question I think is really going to be, is this held by the current vaccines with boosters, or are we actually going to have to do a reformulation of the, va the, vi the uh, vaccine, at least for more vulnerable people, uh, and that that is what we will need to do uh, over time. And it may be actually what we have is a transition period where hold the, the booster holds it for a bit and that buys us time and then we can actually get a specific or uh, what's called polyvalent vaccine and that will allow us then to, in, you know, from later on in this year, be able to respond to it directly. So I think we should, in a sense, what I think we should say is I can see why people would feel deflated, but this is a kind of setback. This is not a, this is not a situation where we're back to square one. We are, we're kind of, we're having to just deal with it as we always thought we might have to. Said that you were furious about the video you saw about the mock press conference. Yes. How did you feel when you saw Allegra? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. I, because of the uh, of the I, of the huge uh, press of of, uh, of meetings so far today, I, I haven't been able to uh, to see that. But I'm of course aware of what uh, Allegra has has said, and uh, I, I I I just repeat what I what I said. I'm I'm very grateful to her for everything that she's uh, that she's done, and. Uh, I, I, I wish her uh, all, all the very best, and, and, and we will certainly miss her, miss her uh, here, here in government. But I, I just want to add to, uh, to what, what, what Chris has said on um, this, this, this crucial period, because uh, I think that uh, there is, a, there is a, uh, at least a, a strong possibility uh, that we will uh, discover in the course of the next few uh, days and weeks that, indeed, the, the, the combination of, 
uh, of two jabs and, and a booster is capable of holding Omicron in, uh, in equilibrium in, in the way that uh, we want. And, and then, as, as I said, we will be able uh, to move forward. And it's always worth bearing in mind that what we're doing today uh, with Plan B is something that we, we set out uh, back in September. So this is not a, a deviation from uh, what we, the position that we thought we might find ourselves in as, uh, as winter uh, winter set in, uh, we always reckoned that you would, we'd see a spike in uh, in disease and um, uh, and, and in infection. Uh, actually, Delta has been remarkably stable. Uh, the problem uh, has has been the, this sudden emergence of Omicron and the real spike uh, that it's producing. And and given the potential numbers that Omicron could produce, uh, we just have to respond uh, today in the in the way that we are. Uh, Pippa Krira from the Mirror. Thank you, Prime Minister. I thought I'd have another go to Nushka's question because I don't think you quite answered it. Um, can I ask why you've asked Simon Case, why you've tasked Simon Case with investigating a party on the December the 18th last year that you weren't at, rather than one on November the 27th where you gave a speech that you were at in breach of the rules by any reasonable legal analysis? No, no. And further to that, Will you extend the inquiry, some cases inquiry, to include any other gatherings, events, parties, use the term that you choose, that took place in number 10 or indeed in your flat, if there is evidence of them? Uh, so first of all, uh, um, Pippa, on the, the, there are, this is a, a, a huge, as people know, this is a, a massive department of state and there are people working flat out uh, the whole time. Uh, working on all sorts of uh, of issues, and they they work they work extremely hard. And uh, I, according to very very well respected uh, civil servants and uh, advisors, special advisors that I've talked to about what happened uh, in the events that uh, uh, that you describe, uh, no rules were broken. Uh, I've asked Simon Case to uh, to look at the other uh, cabinet secretary, uh, Simon Case, to look at. Uh, the uh, the December the 18th event. I'm sure he'll be uh, considering uh, all sorts of things. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, all the evidence I can see is that uh, people in this building have stayed uh, within the rules. If that turns out not to be the case, and, and people wish to bring uh, allegations to uh, to my attention or to the to the police or, or whoever, uh, then of course uh, there will be a proper sanctions uh, but uh, in the meantime i think what we should do is uh, let simon get on with uh, let the cabinet secretary get on with his job and i'm, I'm sure he'll be uh, making his findings public as, as soon as possible ben are you, are you restricting him to looking at December the 18th? I mean, that's, that's the part the, of the question. The, the guidance has been, uh, the, and the rules have been observed at all times. And uh, he's looking at the, uh, the issue of the 18th of December. He may wish to look at other things. That's a matter, frankly, for, for him. Uh, ben Riley smith of The Telegraph. Thank you, Prime Minister. Three quick ones. Tory MPs have suggested you pulled this announcement forward to bounce headlines about the Christmas party. Is that true? Uh, on Christmas parties and nativities, what's your message now to the country? Is that those should be cancelled? And there's no time limit at all to these new restrictions or when they might be considered. When do you think the earliest point that might be? Mid-January, February or spring? And a quick one for Professor Whitty, just picking up on your point about reformulating the vaccines. Do you think there's a real possibility a lot of people might need a fourth vaccine before next autumn to counter Omicron? Right. F thanks very much, Ben. So, look on the on the first point. We'll just imagine the counterfactual. Um, you know, colleagues say uh, or, or people say that um, we're somehow making this announcement to, to coincide with uh, events in in politics. Well, actually, uh, imagine if uh, this step were to have been delayed uh, because of uh, political uh, 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 events of one kind or another. What would people say then? Uh, you've got to act uh, to protect public health uh, when uh, you've got the clear evidence. And uh, I think it was, I'm thinking I'm right in saying that Sage only met uh, yesterday uh, to, to discuss this. Uh, the, the evidence about the transmissibility of the virus has, uh, we've been watching it for days, but it's become, I'm afraid, unmissable, not just in South Africa, but in this country as well. And you know, if you if you delay, 
uh, as everybody knows, with a doubling time of two and a half to three days, uh, you see uh, more doublings and your, your position becomes uh, predictably uh, and inevitably worse and more difficult to, to recover from. On, uh, on Christmas, uh, the, the best way to ensure we all have a Christmas as, as close to normal as possible is to, to, to get on with, uh, with Plan B, uh, you know, uh, irritating though it may be, it is not a lockdown. Uh, it is Plan B, it is what we, uh, we set out uh, a, a, a while back. Uh, and to get your, get your boosters and, and get your jabs. That's the, that's the best way uh, forward. And as for when we'll review the, uh, the, the measures, uh, Ben, which I think was your, fir your third point, um, as, I, as I say, no, no later than, than early January, and, and possibly before uh, if we start to get some of that uh, really, really granular uh, information. But, you know, we, we, need, to, we need to see the, the data and, and work on it pretty hard. Christmas parties and nativities should yes, sorry, no, no. do that. Good, good, no, they should not, no. So thank you, Ben, no. Uh, they, in my view, they should not uh, be, uh, they should follow the guidance, uh, of course, but we're not saying we, we don't want uh, kids to be uh, taken out of school before the end of term, not that there's uh, very long to, to go now. We don't want nativity plays to be cancelled. Uh, we think that it's, it's OK uh, currently on what we can see uh, to, to, to keep going with, uh, with Christmas parties. But obviously everybody should uh, exercise due caution, uh, have uh, ventilation, wash your hands, uh, get a, uh, a test uh, before you go, uh, a sensible thing to do, uh, give yourself uh, or give everybody else at the, uh, the party the confidence that uh, you know, they're, they're going to be meeting uh, someone who is, who is not contagious. Uh, those are simple things that people can do, but th that's, what we're, uh, that's what we're saying. Uh, on the question you asked me, um, I think it's far too early to be sure on this. A lot of scientists are doing a lot of work at the moment just to work out what uh, the current two doses and different combinations of those and the booster will do with uh, the Omicron variant. Um, and that will help give us some information. I think until then, it's probably not very helpful to speculate. The exception to that is that there's a very small group, but a very important group of people who've got significant immunosuppression who uh, we've get, we're giving three doses to as their primary course, they will then get a fourth dose, which is essentially their booster dose. So in that group, the answer is yes. But in the great majority of people at this point, I think the answer is we'll have to wait and see what the data show. Just, just to, to build on, on that, I mean, we've, we've now got vaccine design that allows you to alter them quite easily and to make, as Chris said, so-called multivalent or polyvalent vaccines against different variants in one go. Those are going to provide breadth of coverage in the future. When they'll be needed, we don't know. We've also got antiviral drugs coming through now. Uh, two have been uh, reported recently, which have good effects. So there's, there, are, there are increasing number of options to look at this, but, and this is important, going back to the timing point, SAGE met last week, and met again last night, uh, yesterday, on both occasions, saying that this is spreading rapidly. You don't just watch it spreading rapidly. You need to do something. And that isn't just the boosters. The boosters are incredibly important, but it's also about trying to reduce the possibility of spread, which means reducing social contacts in order to try and achieve that. Thank you. Uh, Emilio Casalicchio from Politico. Thanks, Prime Minister. Um, you just suggested that uh, Sana Case could extend this probe beyond just this alleged party on the 18th. The, the Permanent Secretary for the Department for Education today said that that party that happened at DfE that they apologised for will be included in that probe. So obviously it's quite flexible. So would you encourage Simon Case to look at all allegations of all parties that might have happened in Downing Street last year? And also, would you commit to the inquiry being published before the end of the year? How quickly would you like to see it done? Yeah. And then I've got a question for the scientists, maybe all three of you. Um, obviously, you've just announced new restrictions, including a recommendation from work to work from home. Is the fact that we're here doing this now not a mark of failure? We should have fixed the roof while the sun was shining, surely, with the pandemic, prepare the vaccine booster rollout so it could have been done at lightning speed, but instead it's been quite slow to get this, this new part of the rollout sorted. Uh, actually created a proper world-beating test and trace system, but it feels like we're still not quite there yet as well. We went through devastation last year, but it feels like we still haven't completely learned our lessons. 
And when are we going to learn? Because next time we might be hit by, by a virus that's much more dangerous than the pandemic. So are we going to be actually ready by then? Right. Well, uh, look, I mean, just can I get, get uh, Amelia, can I just go back on uh, some of the things you, you, you've just said? I, I think it is worth people bearing in mind that there are a lot of countries uh, in our immediate neighbourhood uh, that have got restrictions already far tougher than ours and tougher uh, than the ones that we're asking uh, people to implement now, much tougher. And I think people should, always, should also bear it, and that's because we had the fastest vaccine rollout in Europe, Emilio, uh, just to, to, to remind you of that. And uh, it, it is also the case, far from uh, having a, a sluggish uh, vaccine rollout, uh, it, it, what we've now got is, I think, 21 million people uh, having the, a, a booster. Right? We've now got 21 million people boosted. And again, I think I'm right in saying uh, that whether uh, we've, we've, we've boosted uh, more people than any uh, comparable country, and certainly faster than any other European country. So I'm not going to hear any uh, a criticism of the NHS or the GPs or, uh, or, the, or the pharmacists or the volunteers or everybody who's worked blindingly hard to, to get this done as fast as they, as they possibly can. Uh, yes, I think what, is ab what I think is fair, Emilio, is to say that we now need to go much further and, and much faster. And, and in our, uh, having, you know, asking people uh, to, to make further sacrifices as, as we are uh, with, uh, with Plan B. We've got to step up that booster campaign and it's got to, uh, it's, it's got to grow wings. And uh, we, we, you know the pledge uh, that everybody uh, over 18 will get to the offer of a, of a booster by the end of January. I want to see us deliver that. I, and I want to see uh, such a, a huge rate of booster uh, vaccination in this country that if, as I hope, the, the boosters can hold uh, Omicron, then uh, we can get back uh, to the road uh, that we were on. That's, that's what we're trying to achieve. And on your, on your other point about the Cabinet Secretary, as far as I'm concerned, uh, he's got to get to the bottom of, uh, of what he thinks is, uh, is appropriate and, and right. But uh, you know, I, I repeat my, my view uh, that, um, uh, the, to the best of my knowledge, everything I've been told uh, is that uh, the, the rules were followed. But if that doesn't turn out to be the case, then there will be the appropriate, uh, the appropriate sanctions. Yes, uh, as I said in the House today, as soon as possible. Shall I first go on? Yes. I actually want to add on the, on the wider one. I mean, uh, there are multiple points you put there, and I, I'll try and give a very brief answer. Short uh, version on pandemic, of course, we have to plan ahead. But remember that every pandemic is different. The last pandemic that is as bad as this one, and I, I, you can certainly conceptualise uh, very, very bad uh, alternative ones, was HIV, a sexually transmitted infection, completely different way you approach it. So the idea that somehow something you can just take off the shelf and that's your pandemic plan, every single time you have to readjust adjust it according to what you find. This is a very serious pandemic. Second question, second general point is uh, inevitably uh, there have been bumps along the road and things we would do differently if we had done them again. That's obvious. But actually, uh, the idea that a new variant, which we knew was going to come, has been everyone's been accepting that, is somehow a failure, I think, is a misunderstanding of the biology. So speaking as a doctor, you expect problems to occur. When they occur, you address them scientifically and rapidly. And if I can just make one plea on behalf of my colleagues who do the operational side, whether they're on the NHS or elsewhere, uh, quite a lot of those, I'll put this mildly as I can, quite a lot of those who say, isn't it ridiculous, it's going so slowly, have not got as much experience of running national programmes as maybe they might want to have to make those kind of comments. Uh, actually, these things are difficult, and I think the people who are doing it are doing it magnificently, personally. Yeah, well, I wanted to say exactly that. There, there are two, two things I'd pull out. First of all, I think Vaccines Task Force was foresighted to make sure that we had enough boosters for this winter. It wasn't inevitable that we would need boosters, and they got the supply in advance ready to be able to do that. And I think the uh, NHS rollout involving people right the way across the country has been one that we should be proud of actually i think you know it's an operational point not not a science point for, for me but i think i look at them and think they've done a great job of getting that out and you look across other countries and you'll see the booster campaign here has been very effective so i'd like to thank them for everything they've done actually in getting those out both of those groups and then i'd like also to say that if you look at the um, 100 day mission that we published at the time of the G7 that was precisely about trying to make sure all of the parts from surveillance through to rapid production of vaccines and therapeutics through to 
what needs to happen for finance and getting this across the world and equitable access can be improved right the way across the world so that for any new infection going forward, there is a roadmap to try and get this done more quickly and more efficiently than was possible this time. And so I think making sure that 100-day mission, which the G7 endorsed, is something that really is taken up right the way across the world is going to be crucially important. Good. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.